There have been a series of big announcements coming out of Queen's Park over the past several days, so we thought it might be time to get some provincial affairs watchers in here to unpack it all for us. Liberalizing beer and wine sales, a possible breaking up of the Toronto District School Board, continuing fallout from the Sudbury by-election, and maybe the sale of part of Hydro One, the electricity transmission giant. Let's get into all of this with Martin Regcon, the political columnist for the Toronto Star, Queen's Park, Ashley Chinetti, digital producer with the National Post, and Adrian Morrow, Queen's Park reporter with the Globe and Mail. It's good to see you again. It's good to see you again. It's good to see you for the first time here. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. It's good to see you. Very nice to have you here, Adrian. Okay. 30 years ago, we all remember it well. Actually, you two don't. You weren't born yet, but Martin and I do. <laughs> Premier David Peterson, actually candidate David Peterson at that time, Martin said, we're going to have beer and wine in the corner stores. 30 years later, this might actually happen, right? I think this time we're a lot closer than we were 30 years ago. I don't know if it was worth the wait. But when people complain about all those broken promises, they forget that times were different. There wasn't a massive clamor then for changing beer and wine. The industry was largely Canadian owned. And today, I wouldn't say there's a massive clamor, except perhaps for me but, uh, and some <laughs> readers. But there is, there's more of an acceptance that it's time, that, that the system is, is kind of ossified, frozen in time from 30 plus years ago, almost prohibition era. The beer store has barely changed in those 30 years, whereas the world of retailing has changed a lot. And so I think that's where the government is going. And I think the government also realizes that there's a lot of revenue that has been missing, that has been going out of the province, out of the provincial treasury, and it's time to get a share of that profit. Ashley, what are the actual details of what they've got in mind? Well, most of this actually we know largely from Martin's reporting. They haven't officially announced anything yet, but we're hearing that they will be licensing out beer and wine sales to some grocery markets. We're not talking about corner stores, so it won't be going to buy a six pack at the corner. It's going to have to be a grocery store. There's a lot of details there to be worked out. I mean, are they going to limit the time of day sales? Right now, there's a lot of strictures after six on Sunday. You can't find anywhere to buy a bottle of wine, even if you're in the middle of cooking and need one. So will grocery stores be allowed to sell it later? What about grocery stores that already have an LCBO attached inside the building, like the new Maple Leaf Gardens um, has an LCBO inside the building? So I'm assuming that Loblaws probably wouldn't buy a license for that store. But I think there's a lot of questions and a lot of details that remain when we finally get the nuts and bolts of the announcement, presumably in the budget or in the days before. Adrian, what do you think is propelling this along? I think it's a, a number of things. Uh, I mean, number one, I think, is that uh, you know, in the, in the last 30 years, people have become significantly more you know sophisticated consumers. I think when it comes to uh, to beer and wine, and particularly beer, with the sort of explosion of uh, of the craft beer you know movement, I guess, in the last 10, 15 years, uh, there's probably a you know a, a desire on the part of, of the public and sort of a, a public demand out there. When you look at how much you know craft beer sales have sort of gone up uh, relative to the kind of the the big brands uh, that are, are brewed by the companies that own the beer store. Um, so they'd be happy about this announcement. The craft. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, any for, for a lot of them, it's like any any opportunity to sell in uh, in more outlets, and uh, particularly to sell in outlets that aren't controlled by their competitors. You know, by the the big brewers is, uh, is something that uh, that they welcome, or at least the, the brewers I've spoken to. Um, and then I guess the other thing that's that's kind of driving it is um, you know the fact that the government kind of opened the, the door to this when they decided that they had to find a way to get more money out of the beer store. And they said to, uh, you know, to retired banker Ed Clark, they hired him and said, you know, find a way to, uh, to, to get more you know, revenue out of alcohol sales. And once he started looking at, initially just at the LCBO, he said, oh, well, there's also this, you know, we might have to make sense to take a look at the wine rack and the beer store as well. And, uh, and we can find some, you know, some way to get, uh, to get money out of, uh, you know, more money out of, uh, out of these operations. And then once he started doing that, he sort of went a little bit further down the rabbit hole and said, well, while we're at it, you know, we might as well actually talk about reforming the beer store and about, uh, about making you know, beer and wine sales a little, bit, a little bit more accessible than they were before. So it's sort of that combination, I guess, of you know, consumer tastes uh, you know, seem to demand this kind of thing, uh, while at the same time, you know, the government kind of opened the door to it by giving Ed Clark such a, a broad mandate to look at this stuff. Any clue, Martin, about what these licenses would go for and whether they're going to be auctioned off or do you just buy them for a suggested retail price or how does this work? Well, about 300 licenses would be up for grabs and they would be auctioned off and the beer store would also have to pay a franchise fee and the beer store is not going to disappear tomorrow. I don't think anybody wants it to disappear tomorrow. It'll still be involved in the wholesale aspect of it, plus it'll retain its own storefront operations. I think part of the idea here was really just to level the playing field and allow craft brewers to get more opportunity to sell in a retail uh, format that is not completely controlled by their competitor. Now, as I say, the beer store will still have the warehousing option likely in this scenario. You're going to hear a lot of people complaining about this proposition. 
you're going to hear some very small craft brewers complaining that they want more freedom to do what they want to do. You're going to hear small corner stores uh, kicking and screaming that they're cut out of this equation, at least initially. And you're going to hear other people saying, well, not enough has changed. But, so you have to be careful in the political sphere here when you have all these um, critics saying that, that the perfect is the enemy of the good. Look, it's, it's just a first step. I think it shows a sense of progress. It's going to open up a new retail experience that had, was, was badly needed an update. But let's not worry, let's not think too much about finding the absolutely perfect formula. It's a very complicated system with a lot of knock-on effects. And just trying to feel our way is not a bad thing at this stage of the game. But I presume, actually, politically, the beer store is kind of waving the white flag here, right? I mean, these folks took out full-page ads in the newspapers for a very long time. They were fighting the government's attempt to do what it is now doing. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't, I noticed, buy any... $1,500 a plate tickets at the Liberals' big fundraiser, right, the other day, the Heritage Dinner. So I guess they're saying, game's up and we're going to go along? Is that what you're seeing? Well, the beer store union isn't, right? So I don't know if the, it seems like the brewers realized that the last time they tried to do a public relations campaign about this, it backfired. Um, twice they ran those ads that were the print newspaper ads, but they also did this bizarre corner store ad last year that was essentially mocked, showing kids buying like a 40 of Jack and a bunch of beer at their <laughs> corner store. And it was, it literally was just made fun of for days. So I think that they've been smart in pulling back their, their assault on this campaign, but we are hearing it from both the Commercial Food Workers Union which is the, the beer store union, and OPSU, which is the LCBO union. What's their concern? Um, they seem to be raising issues of alcohol tied to violence against women, alcoholism rates with al access to alcohol. There are some CAMH studies that support some of these findings, but I think to tie it to selling a six pack or a bottle of wine in the grocery store is facetious reasoning and trying to, to stir up fear to further your own political aims and the aims of your members who are worried about grocery store cashiers, many of whom are commercial food worker union. I was a grocery store cashier in high school, and I was in that union. Um, well, let me ask you, can I ask you yeah. directly? I think, I mean, one of the arguments I've heard from the union is, how can we tell somebody who's 17 years old, who might be a union member selling beer and wine at a supermarket, if an angry 40-year-old drunk guy comes in there demanding to buy a 40-ouncer? <coughs> Can you handle that situation? Well, you already get the angry, drunk, 40-year-old guy coming in demanding to, to buy something for less than it is. Grocery stores are probably one of the most intense customer service experiences I've ever had in my life. You have people coming from, from funerals, from the worst events in their life, and they will take it out on a cashier. Um, I also had to sell cigarettes and had to card for that and was trained for that. So I don't see how the training is that different. I know there were strictures about when I could start selling cigarettes. So what we could see here is maybe they'll have specific lanes where the person on that lane is always 18 or older. I mean, that's something for the grocery stores to work out when they bid on these licenses is to meet the social responsibility requirements. But having done the job, I don't think it would change it that much. Last word on this part? Briefly, the answer is to look at Quebec. Quebec has Loblaws, Sobeys, and Metro, often unionized with the UFCW, the same union, and they have figured it out. So I think we can look to Quebec for leadership and an experience in this area. But they're a distinct society, and we are not. <laughs> <laughs> moving right along, moving right along. Uh, Adrian, I want you to talk to us about the asset sales, because we're hearing right now that Hydro One, which is this big mammoth publicly owned at the moment, uh, electricity transmission company, parts of it might be sold off, right? What are you hearing? Yeah, that's correct. So there's sort of two, two options on the table the government's considering. So the first one, which was what they floated uh, late last year, was basically splitting Hydro One in half. And so taking, taking away the, uh, the distribution assets, um, so the, some of the local distribution networks in Brampton and a few other places, and, uh, and trying to sell those off to, uh, to the private sector, or at least bring in uh, you know, some private sector investment while keeping the, uh, the transmission lines, which is um, sort of the, the largest part of Hydro One, uh, strictly under the control of the government. The second option, which uh, you know we've just been hearing from you know from sources in the last uh, couple of weeks, is uh, is now under consideration by the government, is to actually keep Hydro One whole, but then sell uh, a stake in it to the private sector on the stock market. And so you'd probably start with about 10 or 15 percent as an initial public offering. If that goes well, then you'd sell up to you know the numbers I'd heard were up to 60 or 65 percent uh, to the private sector on the and stock a market. A potential majority of it. A potential so it would be a majority that you know could potentially be sold to the private sector. What they're considering in the government is capping the amount of stock that any one uh, company or one person could own. So you would allow the government, so the government would have a plurality of shares, you know, whether it was 30% or 35% or something like that. And then the rest could be owned by the private sector, but no private sector, um, single private sector company would own more than 10 or 15%. That's sort of the, the model that they're, uh, that they're looking at. And again, Ashley, why do this? 
I think that our hydro system is a political dumbbell. Like, I don't know how people carry it around. I'm using the wrong word. Albatross? But, yeah, there okay. we go. And uh, so I think doing something about Hydro One, especially when we see the pensions, I mean, if you don't own it fully, you don't necessarily have to answer fully for all the political questions we always have about um, really high pensions, about compensation. I think that there is also clearly some issues that still need to be worked out with the aging infrastructure in our electricity system. I mean, some we've been having flickering this week in Toronto that seems mm -hmm. to be, you know, Toronto Hydro blames it on Hydro One, Hydro One blames it on Toronto. So there's something that despite all the investments the Liberals have done since the infamous blackout of a, you know, a decade ago now, that there's still clearly some big issues that need to be worked out. And I think putting that in the hands of the private sector in the long run removes a political liability, um, though I think it might also create one. Let's take a step back because there may be some people watching us right now, Martin, who are saying, haven't I seen this movie somewhere <laughs> before? I thought Mike Harris already sold Hydro One to the private sector, they are saying to themselves. So what's going on here? Well, Harris tried and had to pull back, and it kind of blew up in his face. And, and the consequence of that is we have, uh, we're almost halfway or almost half pregnant with our electricity distribution system. We broke up um, the old Ontario Hydro into Hydro One, uh, OPG, and the IESO, which I will, an acronym I will not even spell out, oh, Independent Electricity System Operator. There you are. Very well done. So uh, what you have is, is, this, is really the atomization of our, not so, not so much the privatization, but atomization of our, of our hydro system. Furthermore, you have what are, what are called LDCs, local distribution companies. So that's Toronto Hydro, Ottawa Hydro, uh, Brampton One, which is still owned by uh, Hydro One. It's all basically an alphabet soup and mishmash. So while privatiza privatization was tried uh, or, or, and aborted on hydro, it went ahead with Highway 407, which was a political disaster, and we're still paying for that mess. The New Democrats will be reminding the Liberals of that disaster in the weeks ahead as the privatization debate unfolds. But to your, to your earlier question, part of the real motivation for this is to raise money. And it's not the deficit, so screaming at the Well, beginning. it's also... In fairness the, the, to the Liberals, the, the idea isn't so much to make the mistake uh, uh, that the Tories did last time of using that money to pay for the groceries or the beer, beer money. It's to, it's to reallocate that money to pay for infrastructure. So the theory here is, whether you buy it or not, is you're going to take infrastructure money that's kind of dead money or, or sunk money and reallocate it to roads and transit. That's another debate, but that's the, that's the impetus behind it. We know, Adrian, that the New Democrats are saying it is not a good idea to privatize the crown jewels. Uh, who else doesn't like this idea? Uh, the unions, 100%. I mean, they uh, generally tend to favor keeping. Uh, they, they tend to favor keeping everything under under public control. And uh, you know, they've had a pretty good deal. Uh, you know, in terms of, uh, of labor and uh, or of, um, uh, wages and, uh, and pensions and, and that sort of thing under the government. So you can see why they'd want to uh, to remain under the the public aegis. And then they also argue, sort of from a policy point of view, that you know any sort of splitting up of uh, of hydro assets um, just makes things you know increasingly complicated. And that it's better that you you keep as much of this stuff to together as possible. Um, so at this point, you know, the unions are essentially arguing against privatization overall, but they generally seem to say, at least my you know, contacts in the unions seem to say that if you're going to do privatization, it's better that you keep Hydro One intact and sell some stakes to the private sector than, uh, than, than break Hydro One in, you know, into several pieces. And again, are we expecting a, you know, a fully declarative position in the budget coming up in the spring? Yeah, I mean, that's my understanding, is that they're going to, uh, to signal exactly what they're going to do in, in the budget. Um, or at the very least, if they do the IPO, they'd signal the IPO. They might not necessarily say, eventually we want to get up to 65% or whatever, though they, they might do that too. But, uh, but at the very least, they might you know, do that first tranche. Okay, let's set up this next discussion by acknowledging that normal people don't watch question period at the legislature <laughs> every day. We are not normal people, so we do. <laughs> Having said that, for the last several weeks, Virtually every single question in the legislature has been about the fallout of the Sudbury by-election, which is already many weeks in the rearview mirror, but literally, I mean, it's been hundreds of questions over the last few weeks on this issue. Uh, for those who aren't carefully following this, Martin, I want you to take us through it. What is the nut of the opposition's concern about what's gone down in Sudbury? So. In the Sudbury by-election, and by-elections are not normally closely followed anyway, especially outside of that particular city, the Liberals uh, brought over an NDP candidate, uh, federal MP, Glenn Thibault, 
Kathleen Wynne wanted to um, get the uh, liberal uh, who had run the last time to step aside and nominate this incoming new Democrat. And in the process, conversations took place with her deputy chiefs of staff, a local uh, liberal fundraiser, and the premier herself, uh, asking him to step aside. And in at least two of those conversations, which were taped, because the candidate to be, or the aspiring candidate is a quadriplegic who routinely tapes his conversations, uh, offers were, were raised about potential employment or appointments. Those tapes were released, and the rest became a big controversy in Sudbury. And the problem is, the Elections Act, I gather, says you can't offer an inducement to somebody to step aside, uh, and that's what's being alleged here, right? Yes, and the Elections Act says many things that were a surprise to some people, I think. Uh, the interesting thing is that, is that two things. One, uh, this is going to be before the courts perhaps soon if charges are laid. Charges have not been laid yet, but the police uh, have laid, have, uh, have put in, uh, have made statements in court uh, in, in ter terms of trying to get uh, almost like search warrants that are called information to obtain, ITOs, in which they made allegations of improper behavior, illegal behavior, by the Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff and this fundraiser, Jerry Lougheed, in Sudbury. Uh, the Elections Ontario people have said that Elections Ontario regulations and laws were broken. That's not criminal code, that's provincial offenses. So will it get to court? is an open question. Personally, I'm a bit doubtful that the OPP investigation will get to court because it's a criminal, it's a criminal case. And at some point, a judge or a prosecutor, because the OPP are being advised by an outside prosecutor, not Ontario, but from the Federal Prosecution mm -hmm. Service, will say, well, OK, so who is the victim in this crime? Um, people, of, people of Sudbury, perhaps? They've already voted in the Court of Public Opinion to back the Liberals, because the election was decided, the Liberals won, even with these allegations out there and with the tapes on this guy's Facebook page and so on. The Elections Ontario regulations are different because that is really the, the framework where elections practices ought to be respected, more or less. And that's the one to watch closely. You think you might see a little more difficulty for the Liberals there. Okay, Adrian, help me follow the puck here. Because the, if, if the law says you can't offer an inducement, a bribe, a something, to get somebody not to run so that you clear the path for somebody to run. Here's the Liberals' position. I want you to tell me how much water it holds. The Liberals, if I understand it, are saying, we didn't have to bribe anybody to step aside because we'd already made the decision to appoint Glenn Tebow to the nomination. Therefore, there was no nomination race. Therefore, we didn't have to bribe anybody not to run in a nomination race because we'd already decided there wasn't going to be a nomination race. Case closed. Is the case closed? Well, in some ways, regardless of whether or not you know the Liberals had made the decision before they, they reached out to this Andrew Olivier guy to say you he's know, the former uh, candidate. he's the former candidate. Yeah, before they reached out to their former candidate, you know, regardless of whether or not they made the decision before that to uh, you know to appoint Glenn Tebow on the tapes, it's quite clear that they're asking Andrew Olivier to do something for them, right? That they're, it's quite clear that both uh, Patricia Sorbara, who's the, the Premier's Deputy Chief of Staff, and the Jerry Lougheed, the, uh, the Sudbury uh, Liberal fundraiser, are both asking Andrew Olivier, you know, step aside, and then they say, you know, Lougheed says, well, what is your reward? You know, if you step aside, what, what is your reward for, you know, for doing this? Um, you know, Pat Sorbara says um, uh, something along the lines of, you know, uh, we, we should have a broader discussion of what it is that, that you would like to do. Maybe it's a job in a constituency mm, office or an appointment specific. to a board or commission. Mm -hmm. Some sort of specific options for what kinds of uh, of government jobs you know he, he might like to have, and uh, and she said you know anything that the premier can consider is, has in her power to, to grant you, um, you know we can we can talk about giving you that. So in a sense, the liberals' argument is uh, is almost beside the point to you know to the central to, you know the, the the nub I guess of, of the case here, where yes it's true that the liberals didn't have to deal with Andrew Olivier; they could have just um, you know swooped in, appointed Glenn Tebow, and uh, and that would be the end of it. But the fact is that they did reach out to Andrew Olivier and they asked him to do a political favor for them. And, uh, and in exchange for that political favor, they offered him jobs. So the question then becomes, uh, Ashley, is this a case of illegally bribing someone to step aside, or is this just, we happen to have on tape, patronage in action? Unfortunately, I think it might be more that we happen to have on tape patronage in action. I don't think this is unique to the Liberal Party, and I don't think that makes it okay, and I don't think that makes it okay for any political party. But I think this also speaks to a bigger issue in our politics where patronage has become a norm despite the letter of the law. And I think it's a very interesting case to see if this does end up in charges. I agree, I don't think they'll be criminal, but that provincial offenses can carry 
two years less a day, and very severe fines. So we saw this with Michael Sona, got a very serious uh, sentence. And this was I, the conservative The conservative, the robocalls business. federally. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's possible the courts might want to send a message here, and it would be interesting to see if they do. And I think all parties probably need to be nervous about this. Okay, these two are reporters, and so they're not supposed to opine, but you're a columnist, <laughs> so you can opine. The opposition for weeks has been insisting that Pat Sorbera, the deputy chief of staff to the premier, ought to, even though no charges have been laid, ought to step aside pending the outcome of all of this. Do you think she should resign? Well, I think she should absolutely step aside. Uh, resigning is, a, is an academic question, but she should definitely take herself out of the premier's office. I've written that. I believe that. Go work at Liberal Party headquarters if you want to. And if she were the chief of staff, I'm pretty sure she would ask the deputy to step aside herself. They haven't, and that's a puzzle, and, and they remain a target. Why do you think that hasn't been done? Well, I'm told it's because they want to maintain a united front, and it would be demoralizing to the staff if she did. I think that's a dumb idea. I think it's demoralizing much further than that if the longer she stays in there and she's more of a distraction. Um, what I thought you were going to ask me is, what do you think <laughs> about the opposition using that much airtime in question period to, to, to discuss this? Martin, I, I uh, actually wanted to ask you, um, what do you think about the opposition taking so much, <laughs> so much of question period to ask about this as opposed to all of the other things going on? And I can tell you, even though I don't want to speak for these two, but speaking for, from what I hear from all reporters at Queen's Park, they're just gobsmacked by it and, and don't understand why the opposition is using every single question. Just to be clear, the entire hour of question period every day is allocated to this Sudbury Gate question from, I guess, early February. It's now almost mid-March. And a lot of us are asking, well, why don't you just kick off every day with a couple of questions from the leader and then perhaps a third question from your house leader and then ask about other issues, maybe like the ones we've discussed tonight on privatization of Hydro One, big issue for the New Democrats, I would think, or talk about uh, liberalization of alcohol sales. There or talk a train about derailment in Gogama the other day. Train derailment, not a single question from the New Democrats on that issue or anyone else in the House. And I, look, I'm not, I don't like beating up on the opposition, but I find that frustrating. I think they are, their job is to hold the government to account on both Sudbury Gate and on other issues, and that doesn't make sense to me. The, the question, uh, you, you have to give the opposition credit for one thing, and that is they have found 85 different ways of asking the same question <laughs> over and over again. That is true, and the government has basically given the same answer over and over again. What does this do, do you think, to the public's um, appetite or interest in provincial politics? Because clearly, clearly the opposition thinks that something scandalous has happened here and they want to shine a light on it, and that's their right to do so. How do you think it's playing out? I don't think it's actually punctuated the public consciousness. Even even when we had the police documents come to light, you know, there was sort of a, a bubble up that day. People care way more about whether or not they're gonna be able to buy beer and wine in their corner stores. They care way more about hydro rates in this province. I mean we have a PC leadership race going on. Very few people are talking about that. And they do mention, you know, hydro rates. These are things that I think people affect people way more in their day to day lives than it, at the end of the day, what I think for a lot of people ends up being, you know, all politicians stink. I don't think it necessarily helps the opposition parties to be perpetually hammering this when there are these other issues. Um, you know, we didn't mention the sex ed curriculum. I'm sure there are some constituents who, who have questions about that, good, positive, or negative. Um, and there's a lot of issues that have not been debated and have not been given their focus and question period that I, I think at the end of the day, it only paints all, all politicians with a negative brush. Adrian, let me ask you one last thing on this, and that is the guy at the center of all this is Glenn Tebow. He's the new MPP for Sudbury. Has he been, in effect, kneecapped? Uh, is he less effective at doing his job because of the storm he finds himself in? Yeah, I mean, oddly enough, it hasn't really uh, reflected all that much on, on Glenn Tebow because you know there's there's never been any accusation that he was involved in this uh, in this you know plan with uh, um, with the previous candidate. Um, he uh, you know and, and in a sense you know he, he defected from one party to the other, but then he pretty much immediately presented himself to the electorate and allowed you know allowed the you know the people of his of his constituent to decide if they were okay with that or not. So in a sense, he's kind of um, you know escaped pretty much any kind of you know criticism or any sort of uh, sort of problem for what I can tell uh, you know in, in the 
this. I mean, you know, it's like it's entirely possible that uh, it, it's harder for liberals to, uh, to to highlight him, maybe to the extent that they'd like to. They um, gave him a promotion already. All this, but he's you know he's, he's been made a parliamentary assistant, which is you know given that all I think all okay. members yeah. of their caucus, but one or either ministers or parliamentary assistants, so it's it's not really a huge uh, a huge deal. But um, yeah, I mean, he's you know he, he doesn't seem it doesn't seem to have adversely affected him so far. You know, you're from just about as much as any other backbencher. Okay, a couple of minutes to go here. Let's try one more thing. The education minister the other day announced. She's appointing a panel, seven members, Barbara Hall, the former mayor of Toronto, the former uh, chief commissioner of the Ontario Human Rights Commission, uh, will head it. Martin, aiming to come up with some recommendations on what to do with the very dysfunctional Toronto District School Board. What does this look like to you? Well, the Toronto School Board is a unique creature, literally and figuratively. It, it, a, figuratively in that it just causes a lot of trouble, a lot of tension, a lot of dysfunction. Uh, literally in that it has, I think, 24 trustees on it compared to 12 in the more comparable Toronto Catholic School Board. So it's by far the biggest school board in terms of trustees in the province and has, I think, is it 600,000 students or I, I forgot the order of magnitude, but it is a massive by far group. So they're trying to look at perhaps splitting it up, uh, trying to get it, bring it to heel more in terms of being more responsive to what it needs to do. It failed to have a decent relationship with their director of education. It gave unauthorized pay hikes to them in violation of provincial law. It hasn't really acted or responded responsibly to closing down schools that are less than two-thirds occupancy, which means that they have a massive repair backlog and someone's got to pay for it. And if you're paying to keep half-empty schools open, it's pretty hard to find capital money to keep your, your roofs uh, repaired elsewhere. One of the speculations here is that um, it's too big, they want to break it up. Is that in the cards, do you think? I think it's definitely in the cards. And I think part of the reason that they're um, bringing this panel forward is so that panel can make some extreme recommendations and they can pick and choose from them, something that's more politically palatable. I think we also have to keep in mind that both the Premier and your Education Minister do come from a public school board background mm -hmm. and, and, and the Premier directly from the Toronto District School Board. So I think that that makes it that much more interesting if they're willing to go go after this level of government that I also think there's an argument that do we, what do school boards do in this level of day other than provide a voice to parents which they don't seem to be serving very well. They can't levy taxes anymore and they don't distribute funds in the way that they once did. The, the bargaining's all at the provincial table and then they're left to work out the details. Adrian, last 20 seconds to you on this. I think uh, what's interesting is that the, the, uh, the scandal at the TDSB has sort of provided cover, I think, for the government to do a lot of things, or to at least look a lot of things that they've wanted to look at for a long time with the TDSB, whether it's, you know, rationalizing the number of schools and, you know, and, and allocating resources better, or even these sort of bigger, you know, more existential questions about should we have one big school board that's that powerful, or should we break it into a lot of smaller things? This is stuff that I think, you know, there's been buzz about that uh, within the government for years, and uh, this has sort of just been an opportunity to, uh, to finally go in and actually take a serious look at doing it. Guys, thanks for your help on this. Martin Redcon, Ashley Chinetti, Adrian Morrow. It's great to have you three into TVO tonight. Appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. Pleasure. Thanks. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.